correctly with the correct amount. Radio, your gamers roll. www.d20radio.com Roll for initiative. Hello folks and welcome back to the Roll for Initiative podcast, issue number 37. I am one of your hosts, DM Vincent, along with DM Jason, DM Nick. Jason, we have a special guest tonight. Uh, why don't you tell us who we have along with us? Okay, we've got a really special uh, guest here on Roll for Initiative this week. Uh, this is somebody who I've been uh, hoping to get on for some time now. He actually does two of my favorite podcasts. <laughs> he does uh, Common Sense and Hardcore History. And uh, fans will know who I'm talking about. Yes, that's right. We have Dan Carlin. Hello, Dan. Hey guys, thanks for having me on. Our pleasure. Yes, nice, wonderful having you on. Well, so, I'm glad so, to be here. So Dan, let's start out with uh, a little bit about Hardcore History, which is the show that um, I think we'll be talking more about tonight, since we're going to talk about how uh, history and AD&D. So why don't you start out with just a brief uh, description of Hardcore History, um, where people can find you, and what you do. Well, you can find us at dancarlin.com or on iTunes, and um, what we do is, I guess the best way to put it is we've tried really hard to build a sort of a blank canvas where we can do whatever history program or content or uh, subject matter or topic sounds interesting at any given time and have it actually fit in the format, and um, and then we explore that stuff, and sometimes it's... Um, it's linear history, like right now we're talking about the decline and fall of the Roman Republic, and sometimes it's weird stuff like, you know, how much does parenting throughout history influence the time period and the history of a certain era? So um, we, we like to think of it like the Twilight Zone is as a television show. You never know what you're going to get when you tune in, but the hope is that by the time it's over, it would have matched whatever we think our format is, and it would have uh, gotten some people interested. Yeah, that's right. You're t- you were talking about the uh, Suffer the Children episode, I guess. Right, and that's yeah. – um, I mean I think that's kind of a strange topic, but we had a lot of fun with it, and some people didn't like it. And then eventually over time it becomes through repetition, I guess you could say, sort of an old favorite. I always look at the old Star Trek episodes and see which ones are you know, famous, popular ones for everybody, but how no matter how weird or twisted one of the strange ones are, that's somebody's favorite. And that's kind of how our episodes work out too. Right. And I think that's the thing that's really interesting about hardcore history to myself and a lot of the people that listen Mm. is that it's not your typical history show that just tells you what you're going to read in a book. First of all, because you don't describe yourself as a historian, you describe yourself as a history fan. Right. I have an education in history, but what I'm trying to bring to the table is the stuff that we like. I mean, I used to sit around, um, you know, lunchtime with the other guys who were history majors, and we would talk not about some highfalutin textbook. We would talk about some incident or uh, figure or occurrence in history that blew our minds. And so that's what we talk about. And if it blows my mind, the hope is that the people who become attracted to the show feel the same way. And that's kind of how we approach it. Right. So a lot of the times, the things that get discussed are about what it's like to consider one really specific aspect. Like you said, how does parenting change the way things are? Or if, if the rulers were on different drugs or alcohol, how did it affect their, their uh, decisions? Or <laughs> what was it like to actually be in the thick of a battle? And those are some of the things we're going to talk about later on the show uh, tonight. So um, before we jump into that, I thought it'd be kind of interesting to go a little bit into one of the other reasons that we contacted you for the show, because in addition to uh, Hardcore History and Common Sense, which we're fans of, I've heard you mention a few times on your shows uh, that you are a bit of a gamer as well. So I thought maybe you could tell us some of the the games that, that you've played in the past or even now. Well, I was going to say that's a really long time ago for me. I don't have any time for anything fun ever again, apparently. Um, no, but uh, uh, I, I was a war gamer for a long time. Um, 
I still have tons of soldiers, hand painted soldiers lying around all over the place in drawers and stuff. But um, but it's been a very long time. I mean, I know you guys focus a lot on D and D, and I haven't played D and D since the heyday. And when I say the heyday, I'm showing my age a little bit here. But we're talking 1976. You're on so, the right uh, show. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you are. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I have the original book somewhere, uh, uh, unfortunately marked up, I'm sure, and not worth any money, but uh, but all lying around. I never, I was never involved with it. Once anything became hardcover, it was after my era. So I don't, I don't really get to do much of anything anymore. Occasionally, I'll get to play. Um, there'll be a computer game, which if I'm killing some time, I'll play like uh, Hearts of Iron. Or something like that, but but by and large, I'm more of an ex gamer or a suspended gamer or a gamer in a coma right now, and hopefully someday <laughs> I'll retire and be able to pick up where I left off. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to uh, cover today, so that the people who are listening will kind of know what to expect. Um, we're going to go through about three different main types of things. Uh, with you today, Dan. Um, first, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the different eras that people can set their games in and take a look at what those eras were like, for, you know, broad strokes, because we only have so much time, but broad strokes historically. Um, and then we'll focus in on one of them and talk a little bit more about what maybe some aspects of daily life were like in that era. Uh, and then finally, I thought something would be really fun was if we took a look at some of the different classes that exist in AD&D. We'll introduce the classes, and we'll try to think of what might be a historical comparison, uh, something that would have actually existed in medieval Europe or even Asia or somewhere else, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of compare those against each other. Okay. So, so um, before we go into those, there was a couple of things that I wanted to specifically touch on that I think um, are really relevant. To, uh, to, to your approach with Hardcore History. Um, mm -hmm. And there are, two, there are two things that, that I've heard you say on the show, and I'll just throw them both out there and let you kind of go where you want with them. Um, one of them is about thinking about ancient people uh, or any time in the past, and the fact that we often think of them as being, you know, somehow less advanced, and they could, you know, how did they ever figure anything out? Um, but in fact, we don't give them enough credit for being every bit as clever or maybe more clever than us. Um, well, actually, let me start with that one, if, if you have any perspective on that. Well, I had a professor once that tried to remind me of that, and he, it, it, not just me, I think the whole class, and he was talking about um, the inherent biases we modern people bring to the table when we're talking about our ancestors. And he said there are things we have, obviously, that they didn't have. And it depends on you know how long ago you're going and what society you're talking about. But let's just say something before the advent of um, writing and literature and, uh, and, and such. He would say that, look, what they didn't have is the ability to go to a library or these days go to the Internet and see the accumulated knowledge that we all have access to. So they didn't have that. And they may not have had the educations that we had. But... Even going back to something like caveman times, you still have innate human cleverness, and we, you also have the ability to uh, learn things through an oral tradition. You know, that's, as a matter of fact, that's one of the things we use for hardcore history as a model, the old idea of um, the tribal oral historian or the troubadour or any of these people whose job it was in a pre-modern society to transmit the you know, information filtered through myth and legend and hyperbole and all that stuff of an earlier time and, and the histories and the ancestors and the events of the past. Um, the same thing is true for their, our ancestors. We still can't figure out how they did some of the things they did with all of our modern stuff, with all of our computer enhancement. Don't understand how they built this or accomplished that. It's interesting to think that there's actually things if we went back in time that we couldn't do that they could. For example, I don't know if, if, if you know or if anybody does. Have, has anybody yet figured out how they made Damascus steel? Uh, I don't know if that's one of the things that's been solved recently or not. Uh, Damascus steel, of course, the uh, material used in the famous Syrian swords that everybody used to talk so much about. Um, 
pattern welding. I think it's pattern welding, isn't it? I don't know if uh, if they figured that out or not. Sometimes I'll say that there's some current myth that's still in existence, only to find out, you know, after I check later that it's recently right. been solved. But or or then I'll tell people it's recently been solved, only to find out that you know it's not a very good source that says it's been solved or whatnot. So I can't answer that question. But that's a perfect example of the kind of things that people would throw out there and wonder how they did something. And you would think we'd be able to figure it out today through modern methods. Yeah, that's actually a very good point there, Dan, is we don't give enough credit to some of what our, our ancestors have done. Plus, I think it also, when you talk about things like this, is we forget to put things in the historical context, um, especially people who aren't, you know, understand about history and how history works, the whole historiography of it. And... Um, you know, things like you're talking about, like the spot welding or things that leap to mind, like Stonehenge is like one of the big ones that people, you know, how did they build Stonehenge? What were the methods? How could they have done that? So, you know, that's 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 really good that we we remember that we uh, give our ancestors a little more credit for what they're doing, even though we can't figure it out right now. They were able to do it because humans are amazing creatures and we can put any we could do anything when we put our minds to it. Well, and you know, it's funny. There, there's a couple of books that just were re-released. I want to say Barnes and Noble re-released them. Um, but H.G. Wells, the famous scientific uh, author, actually wrote some histories of the world. And it's funny because as I read them, it reminds me kind of like hardcore history. I mean, he's an amateur historian too. He's focusing yep. on on interesting aspects. And when you read him, he he reminds you of things. That the academic historians, as much as I love them and as great work as they do, maybe don't want us to consider. Like one thing I was reading him the other day, and he was he was pointing out how much of what we think we know are historians theorizing, and then another historian from a later era will quote that person as though that's real knowledge that we know for sure, and eventually you create a whole, you know, you talk about history, historiography, which is the, the writing of history and the creation and foundation yep. of history, and, and how that sort of thing becomes a construct that's a human mental construct too, and I, he says, you know, if you actually go to the sources, obviously he's writing almost 100 years ago, so the sources are the same, but we may know more about them through archaeology and whatnot. But he says, if you actually go to the sources, what do we really know about Julius Caesar? And here's how much right. we really know. And it freaks you out sometimes to think that history might be on such a fragile read. Yeah, that's very good, very good points there. So let's talk a little bit about our first topic, which is the different eras that uh, gamers can set their worlds in. When people think of AD&D, they often think of a sort of fantasy, maybe pseudo-European medieval era, but there's a lot of different ones. So what I wanted to maybe begin by asking you, Dan, was if we could uh, just give a little bit of an overview of maybe what the general era, and I don't know how, <laughs> how I'm asking this question, but I'm going to just kind of go down the line with some of these. And let's start a little bit older. Let's start with the Bronze Age in Europe and kind of what that era was typified by the bronze age in europe um well it, it depends unless on... i just got the wrong continent entirely i told you i'm well, not no smart no one. no the, <laughs> the only thing we know about um i mean when you think about the bronze age it's more um at least in the west you're talking about a mediterranean construct so you're talking egypt the levant uh anatolia which is the uh, asia minor and turkey um, you've got the uh, Mycenaean culture in Greece. Um, you've got very early uh, stuff going on in Italy. If you go to like the areas where the Celts are in a little later period, you're dealing with um, you're dealing with cultures that we only know from archaeology. So the histories of those areas aren't known. Um, you know, of course, and of course, history kind of relies on writing because once you go below writing, you're pretty much into archaeology only. Um, so. As far as the Bronze Age that most people think about, you're talking about areas, I mean, the New Kingdom Egyptian are the Bronze Age. So when you talk about the great Egyptian kings like Tutmos III and Ramses III, and those people are all from dynasties that were in the Bronze Age. Battles like Kadesh with the Hittites are all in the Bronze Age. Uh, Babylon and... Um, and the people that are what you would call maybe the proto-Persians are already fighting like Iraq and Iran will be fighting forever. Um, so, I mean, it depends on where you're talking about. You get the, the beginnings of the early 
dynasties in China. Um, so you kind of have to, if you're going to design some world based on a Bronze Age level of technological development, you're going to have to decide what sort of feel I would say you're going to want your culture to have. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it does. So if you were thinking about a lot of times people uh, bring in they, – they sort of mash up different eras and cultures in their games uh, because, you know, you're looking in a, in a source book and you see some deities from uh, South America and you see some cool weapons from ancient China and you think, well, I'm going to just put these together. If you actually had uh, – let's take a Mesoamerica uh, and then maybe uh, – Europe around the early Roman Republic type of era, and then some of these Bronze Age things. If would would it be a massive just? Would it be disproportionate or uh, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for here. Asymmetrical, I guess. If if these cultures were to clash, I never think that way. I mean, if you're you know you could if you look at cultural development as. Um, as something that occurs in a certain order. I mean, you get this, and then you get that, and then you get this next thing. I mean, you could envision going to other planets and seeing different people in different stages of development. Um, and when worlds collide, which throughout history, you know, it's something that doesn't happen really anymore, but you could go look at when Westerners from Europe first arrived in what they called the New World, and you see these clashes of cultures where the Europeans have the crossbows and the armor and the early guns, and the natives are working with obsidian-tipped weapons. Um, so that stuff does happen. What I think everybody needs to sort of be aware of is that once the cultures do collide, there's a very quick transmission, especially of things like military technology, because if there's not, the people at the, um, the lower end of the scale don't last very long. Um, that's the reason, by the way, you see such disproportionate um, differences in in weapons and fighting between cultures that haven't come into contact. Well, I mean, if you take a game like Civilization, if you want to get to the computer game version mm. of it, um, if you're one of those cultures that doesn't have any connection to another culture for a long time, every discovery you have is something you discovered yourself. If you have a lot of contact with other cultures, you all tend to develop with each other, and 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 your contact with another culture helps you learn. Uh, the developments that allow them to have their new kinds of armies, and then you do, and because if you don't, you're not around very long. So it's not that strange to think of there being all this different technology. Some of it can be chalked up to either different styles. I mean, maybe someone likes the weapons that they have, or different resources. Maybe someone has to have obsidian-tipped weapons because they don't have iron where they are. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you if you stay too far behind... Uh, and you're in contact with all those other powers. You, you know, what's the old... I mean, you talked about the Bronze Age. Well, the old line is some cultures in that era had access to the secret of iron making, <laughs> and some people didn't. Yep. And and either you traded or bought or paid for iron, found out how to make it yourself, or got conquered by someone who had it. I think that's a good ex a good uh, point, because if we're putting it into game terms, you know, you've, you've got a lot of different... Uh, cultures that are maybe moving around on this world map if you've actually you know created a campaign that's that big and you have of course in in the dnd game of now we're not just talking about humans we're talking about races of orcs and elves and everything else it would make a lot of sense in those areas where the cultures clash and combine that they're not going to be sticking to just their technology or even necessarily their cultural ways everybody wants the best weapons i think that's a pretty much constant wherever you go so let's focus in on the one historical era that people most associate with uh, AD&D or you know, any uh, D&D style role-playing game, and that's the medieval European world. Um, and I wanted to ask a few questions about you know, life in that ancient world. And the first one I wanted to go to was maybe the most obvious, and that's what, how different it must be to actually be in a battle yeah. Then. Well, you know, I, I got to say, I'm not sure we know. Um, and I think this is something we talked about on the Hardcore History Show, too. Um, when the people who were writing during these times assumed a certain level of knowledge. And the way I always try to put it is imagine trying to explain to somebody two or three thousand years from now. Um, what warfare was like for us. We take certain things for granted. Take, for example, 
um, what the shooting of a gun sounds like, what the reaction of somebody shooting the gun is like, what the reaction of somebody being hit by a bullet is like. All that stuff is all so much of a, of a, of a part of what we already understand that if you actually wrote those things in a book – people would think you were silly. Why are you explaining something everybody already knows? <laughs> the same thing <laughs> happens to be a problem in history where people who understood this stuff innately didn't write down details they considered to be common knowledge because it was common knowledge. So now when we try to reconstruct what that was like, we're missing key components. And so people go back. I mean, for the longest time, I said if anybody was going to let me go back in a time machine – I wanted to hover over some ancient battle and just see what it looked like. We still don't know. I mean, okay, this is maybe a little arcane, but we don't know if large numbers of people fighting each other actually slammed into each other or if there was a – I mean, a lot of the people who study this stuff for a living think there may have been a moment where – there's three or four feet of space between the two lines of fighting individuals and then people reach across and pull each other. I mean, they just don't know. And so when you ask what it was really like, um, I think you can answer better what combat between two single individuals was like than trying to understand the physics of thousands of people um, actually fighting each other. I've actually gone and seen movies and looked at um, all sorts of video of major riots involving riot police on one side and mm. rioters on the other when you have thousands and thousands of people and try to see the dynamics involved and see if you can glean anything from that. But that's that's one of those things that we just, you know, they're trying to reconstruct. We don't know what it was like. And of course, people in a riot, they're not trained. Well, at least probably at least half of them are not. <laughs> well, you could so, make a case that in a lot of the battles throughout history, uh, I mean, are the are the tribal warriors who don't come from a um, tradition of group-oriented training. In other words, training in units, training to follow commands, marching, discipline, those guys. I mean, are the Viking warriors who could come and attack your army in the thousands, they may all be fabulous individual fighters, but they're a mob when they get together. So it may, it may not look much different. Again, hard to tell. We don't know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah we, can, we can speculate. Uh, at least from we can glean some information by like uh, from from a few accounts that but and those are even very rare because like you were saying uh, they didn't write a lot of that stuff down because it was considered common knowledge they were probably thinking oh everybody knows how we fight everybody's done it because it was a, a most of the eras before that well I don't know comparatively to today but you know they're violent times. The violence was much more um, – it wasn't as distant, as I, I guess you should say, than than is in probably in, in what we call our modern world. It's not everybody is exposed to this sort of like, like warfare as, it, as we are now. So and that's I'll give the, you an example. One, does, does cavalry charge infantry that's formed up in some sort of formation? Do they do that? There's a big controversy in the military history uh, circles about whether or not that actually happened. And you'll get people who will say horses as animals would not do that. And other people say that, yeah, you know, it, it did happen because the sources say it did. So, again, we don't know. Okay. So um, it, it goes to a good point that you just raised is the difference between somebody's uh, – you know, between personal combat one on one and these sort of large army things, and you know, it's something that I, I was struck by. Dan, I know you've mentioned a few times lately. You've become a fan of Albion Swords, the guys that make uh, not reproductions, but actually, uh, do they say recreations? Recreations are what they call them. Yeah. And when you and, and what's them right here? Actually, I'm looking at them right now. Oh, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> so, so just the very act of holding in your hand a mil and realizing that these are military weapons and it just puts you in mind that th when you think about what it must take to actually run a so you know run a sword at another person it's very difficult to to uh, picture that well I, as i said it's easier for me to figure out individual combat and those kinds of things i think you start becoming very complicated when you try to imagine what it's like 
with lots of people. Um, I mean, I can look, I can pick up the sword here and I can take it outside and swing it around and you can go online and you can see people um, trying as best they can to fence with each other and get an idea. But, but just to re, just to, to reestablish that point we were talking about, about how you don't know things, I happen to own, I don't know, I want to say five or six books that are the medieval manuals on sword fighting. I don't mean fencing like with, you know, rapiers. I mean old-fashioned 1300s medieval sword fighting. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing is that that's a lost art, that for the last 10 years or so, people have been trying to recreate. Now, the problem with recreating this is that everyone's working from the same sources. They've got these books that have pictures of all the different maneuvers and, uh, and, and what they call the guards and all the various different ways you will fight with these swords, but no one's ever seen anyone do it. And, of course, the, right. pictures, are, and the pictures are two-dimensional. And so, you know, one of the reasons everyone's so into Japanese fighting and Eastern martial arts is that those things never died out. In the West, they did die out. And modern people are trying to recreate these lost arts using whatever sources we have available. So I can take this sword out and swing it around all day long. It doesn't mean we have any idea that we're doing it right. True. That's a very good point that you brought that up about the uh, what is really a, uh, European martial arts and how there has been a trend in the past 10 years or so. And I think uh, groups like the SCA, the Society of Korea of Anachronism, uh, and others who are like medieval reenactment groups try to recreate some of that. But um, I think it's become a little more of a serious thing besides going as a, as a pastime to, to do is as now we're trying to uh, decipher some of these, uh, this material that we got and really understand how the, uh, when you talk about knights and maybe the foot soldiers of medieval Europe, how they actually fought. And I'm glad you brought that up because that is a relatively new development in, in at least in medieval studies. Well, I think it shows also our inability to get our mind around how it really was. Yeah. Well, the other thing then is training itself. So we don't know, as you say, exactly how people fought. And I don't know if there are any contemporary accounts from the time that talk about training. But, um, well, actually, do you know, do, do we know anything about how uh, soldiers or knights or any types of fighting men trained? Yes, that information is actually, that, that's better information than how battles went. Um, right. They, they can tell you, for example, you know, the things that a knight would go through, um, you know, to become a knight. They would talk about – well, and for example, things like tournaments and all that is all part of keeping uh, people trained and fit and honed. And um, what's not known is how much what went on in the tournament replicated what went on on a battlefield and those sorts of things. But that that's all part of the training. And of course, the Western tradition at that time was um, individual training. You know, knights – I, I was just going to say that knights don't train in units, but even that's controversial. Um, the Normans would train in small units, what were called conroys, and um, and 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 so there was some kinds of group training. But what doesn't seem to have happened is you never seem to get whole, whole armies out on the field like the Romans used to do it and have full maneuvers, or the way the Chinese used to do it and essentially have what they called bloodless battles. Um, so when you would get large medieval armies together, and large medieval armies weren't even that large, um, into big groups, that it was it was like an inarticulated mass in a sense, very hard to maneuver, very hard to control. Yet you still would get Norman knights in small units of ten or twenty of them trying to work together and train together. It's interesting because you know one of the main tropes of a role-playing game is generally the idea that as you progress through the game, you rise in levels. You know, it's some way of uh, quantifying the experience that you're gaining and, and the, the skills that you have. And so in AD&D, there's this idea that your character has to stop and train in between. It doesn't just happen automatically. And I think it would be kind of interesting to bring the idea of the tournament in or think about some of the ways that historically... A, a knight or a soldier or any type of fighting man would learn more skills. Would he go to an individual mentor? Would he go to a tournament? Would he go train in a group 
I wonder. I think we also have to factor in that, you know, there's no television, there's no video games, there's a lot of things that, I mean, you try to think about what kids today would be doing if many of the things that distract them weren't there, and you start to think, well, a lot of what they might be doing in some of these societies is sword play and fooling around, imitating their elders. You know, I mean, I, I always look at, at people like the, the nomads of the Eurasian steppe, the people who would be the Mongols or the Turks or the Huns or the Scythians or those people. These are people who, are, who even as children are already in their daily lives practicing the very skills that will make them so nasty in warfare. And it's just a part of the – I mean that's, that's, that's one of the reasons I remember um, reading something where the Byzantines were talking about wishing that they had their own troops – that were of a quality of those people from the Eurasian steppe. But the problem is, is that you just can't create those people. You can't train somebody up to that standard. You have to be born to it. And that's because yeah. it's all those hours that there's no way to factor into the mix of stuff that goes into your military training without even knowing that it is military training. Another point uh, we also need to make, when you talk, when we're talking about the tournaments, when we're talking about it in, in the medieval tournaments that, many of these knights participated in was not only was it a, a form of training, especially when you're talking about when the tournaments really got popular in the late 12th to early 13th century. And they were specifically training, not necessarily to fight each other, but also when they were going on crusade, but when knights were fighting each other and they were in tournaments and the, the whole jousting thing, for example, was something that really didn't come into its own until late into the period. But it was a form of revenue for the knights. It was a way of making money <laughs> along with the training issue as well. So not only would they go to these tournaments and, uh, and, and hone their skills, but part of it, like the, the grand melee, was that you would have knights – in, in an area where they would they would try to capture each other. It was more about capturing each other and holding another knight for ransom and paying that off and also the training as well. So that's, that's another interesting as, aspect when you talk about the medieval tournament. It was a, a, almost a game of like uh, not capture the flag, but um, trying to capture each other for money. So let's go into, uh, it's a good segue to go into the classes themselves. So what I want to do is uh, talk about some of the different classes that exist in AD&D. And as long as we're talking about knights and fighting men, uh, let's start with two types of fighting classes in AD&D and try to come up with what that might mean historically. I'll start with what I think is maybe the easier one, and that's the paladin. So in AD&D, you have this character class, the Paladin, who is the sort of mythical knight of uh, almost you know, Victorian romances when they look back at the Middle Ages and imagine this, the chivalric code. How, how does that compare, first of all? W w could we find anyone in history that might actually embody that type of a person? I, I, I'm going to qualify that by saying I'm sure we can – but they were nowhere near the norm. I mean, um, when you read some of the, the histories, they will talk about these knights in a romantic way um, that just doesn't seem to conform too much with the history. I think those are individuals that stood out sometimes. But, but I mean, the more you read about them, the more, especially from people who were coming from writing from outside that culture, um, you can go read some of the Byzantine records where they're talking about the Western knights, and they just sound like the dirtiest, nastiest <laughs> barbarians you've ever seen. And yet that's not the same sort of feel you get when you read the European records. And so I think it's a question of what seemed normal to them, and maybe it's by comparison. So, so maybe the people that they're romanticizing as these great, wonderful, chivalric people um, – are only that way by comparison to what's normal in their society. I don't see a lot of examples of that. And when you do, it does happen to come later in, um, in the medieval era. Certainly if you're looking at around the 1100s, people are really nasty, you know, still. You know, it's, it's funny because if you're thinking about looking at the same person from two different perspectives, I immediately thought of the show you did, Step Stories. And the idea of what it was like to see – 
these invading uh, Mongol hordes coming down. And of course, we know from a European perspective the kind of uh, image we had of them. But I wonder what their image was of themselves, what romances they told themselves. Well, that's funny because I remember reading something about um, what the Mongolian people in modern-day Mongolia see that whole era as, and Genghis Khan is a huge hero. I mean, he's on their money. Um, And to them, these are people that have been um, mistreated by history because they're not the ones who wrote the histories. Yet I remember um, I was in in a class in college— and it was one of those things where you were allowed to do a sort of an independent study, and the, and the professor was a Chinese gentleman, and I chose Mongol military tactics as my subject. Um, and I wrote this whole piece on Mongol military tactics, and it came back, and the grade was like a C-plus or something. And I said, well, what did I do wrong? <laughs> oh, no. And he said, well, you didn't talk about any of the horrible things they did to Chinese people. And I said— <laughs> Well, but I was writing about tactics and strategy, and but he was still so upset and so offended, and there was still this ingrown – he was talking about you can still go find these horrible archaeological sites, and I tried to explain to them that it was out of the scope of what I was trying to do, but I think the point was well taken is that if you were on the receiving end of those people and you were the only ones doing any of the writing – it didn't come out looking very good. And I think that's how the people in Mongolia feel like they ended up on the short end of the stick because the Mongolians weren't writing their own history. What's the old line Churchill said? I know history will treat me kindly because I'll be writing it. Well, the poor yeah. Mongols did, didn't fall into that category. Or history is written by the victors, something like that. Well, the Mongols <laughs> were the victors. That's why that's a little strange. Um, yeah, that is a little bizarre. <laughs> yes, uh, but, but, but unfortunately, they were never really able to check the work, perhaps. Hmm. It's interesting. There's a there's a movie that came out recently, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's set in uh, Roman times in Britain, and it's looking at what it would be like to be on both sides, what the Romans must have seen the native Britons as, and vice versa. Um, I wish I could remember. It's a blockbuster that just came out. Uh, I'll have to look it up. Um, but so going back to the classes. The, I mentioned the paladin, and the paladin is a type of fighter. So you have this idea in the game that you have a fighter. And, of course, it could be a man or a woman in the game. It's very gender neutral. You don't have any uh, – there's no, there's no penalty or benefit to being either gender for any of these classes. So you have this idea of somebody who makes their living as a fighter. And I wonder if we go away from the knights and uh, can we find examples of that? Oh sure, that's I mean that that's a classic human occupation, almost wherever you go, um, and especially tribal warrior societies. And the thing about the knights is that that's a transitionary period, and most people don't look at it that way. But really, that's a period where you're trans you're you're, you're changing from the whole Viking era with the Franks and the Vikings and a Europe that's all I mean. It really is. a Because what happens is if you look at history in sort of a fast forward from Europe, you go from Roman times where the Romans were providing the same sort of global governance in their version of the globe that the United States is now, sort of. You know, they decided what the monetary currencies were going to be. They protected the trade routes. They did all that. And when that fell apart, there was this huge long period where the world, their world, was trying to figure out how they got along without all that. (laughs) And, and, and you go from Vikings and all sorts of different barbarians who then coalesce into states who seem civilized compared to what came before. But really, it's not until the Renaissance that you see them really coalescing into what we would call more civilized types of people. Um, and so in medieval times – the versions of the knights going off and hiring themselves out to the highest bidder, that's the continuation of stuff that was going on forever in European history where whole groups of people would hire themselves out um, as military units to folks. I mean, and you see that all over the world. That's a human institution. It's just made me think of that line in the in Monty Python's Life of Brian. What have the Romans ever given us? Uh, Roads, every uh, aqueducts. <laughs> um, all right, let's go to a, a slightly tougher classes. Let's go to the cleric. So we've got the cleric who there's a there's sort of a continuing 
debate among people who play AD and D is the cleric meant to be more close to a priest or more close to sort of a, a, a hospitalier? Is that how you say it? Hospitaller. Hospitaller. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, or Templar. Okay, but if if we go towards the priest side a little bit, uh, can we? Can we think of examples from that era of religious orders that also would fight? And perhaps would they be involved with medicine and healing in any way? Well, it wasn't just religious orders. I mean, there's whole uh, – you can go to medieval Germany and the bishops often fought. Um, oh, yes. You know, really? Yeah. They would even have their own uh, uh, armor and special things to identify them as uh, as military men. Um, and yes, I mean, the hospitalers, I mean, that's where their name comes from. It was the Hospital of St. John. Um, yep. they, would, they would treat uh, um, um, uh, people that would go to the Holy Land, pilgrims. Um, they would keep the trade routes safe, things like that. As a matter of fact, most of those orders did not become military until they had been um, more ministering, if that's a word, ministering, <laughs> for a while before then. Um, the military stuff usually came later. Um, that's one of the, you know, the thing about the D and D classes, as I remember them anyway, is that there are only a few that really conform to history. And I think the, the, the clerics are one, you know, you know, other than spells and whatnot that, that, sure. that, was, that was real. Right. That's interesting. How did a bishop transform from what we think of today? How does it transform from that? How do we reconcile those two ideas? Well, I can't. Actually, I know, well, I, that, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you go ahead. Well, all right. Uh, I just I just learned this actually recently. I'm taking a, I'm finishing up my degree in history. I'm focusing on medieval Europe. I'm hopefully be a relatively decent medievalist. But one of the things we're going into uh, late medieval Europe is this special situation that you have with the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope, and who's got. Who's in charge over the bishop? You probably know about this one, Dan. No, and all There's the electors like, and all that, sure. Right, right. The And the whole investiture controversy that happened at the time. Who was in charge of the bishops? And one of the things that they finally decided on, the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope, was the bishops in Germany, what we know as modern Germany, he was in charge of them and appointing them but once you get south of the Alps, it was the Pope's show. <laughs> well, and, and, that, and not always. I mean, that's why you have yeah. so many German emperors and kings going down there into Italy and fighting, because that would uh, rear its ugly head on a regular basis. Exactly, exactly. And that whole thing so would, even— Would you actually get uh, the religious orders structured in some way similar to a military order? The re- I'm, I, the conf- question's confusing because the religious orders were military orders. There's your an- there's my answer then. Okay, <laughs> is I'm starting from the wrong premise. They 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 were organized as military orders. They often had rules like you couldn't shave because you were supposed to look like Christ. Um, one of the things that you know in the old days we used to believe um, in war gaming that the military orders were the most hard troops to control, the most passionate, the most um, filled with religious fervor and fanaticism. A more recent viewpoint is that they were, in fact, better trained and better military men than your average knights because they literally lived that job 24-7 as opposed to, you know, being um, a weekend warrior, I guess you could say. And there were Mm -hmm all sorts of rules about what they could and couldn't do on the battlefield. You know, if you, if you didn't follow what your commander wanted to do, the punishments were harsh and you, you literally had to live with these people every day in the monastery and you could be punished by not being allowed to speak and all these other things. So the discipline was, was more rigorous comparatively anyway. I'm going to go now to uh, a much more fanciful class, but when I think that we could come up with some, uh, historical comparison to I'm going to go straight to the magic user. So obviously there wasn't anybody in 1100 casting spells at the enemy, but it's my understanding that there were people, whether you think of alchemists, sorcerers, maybe even tribal medicine men, what are some people we could look at as historical models for that? 
I think once you get to Christian times in Europe, that whole thing goes away. Um, you know, with witchcraft and all that stuff, the connotations were much, much too heavy. Um, if you get into pre-Christian Europe, then all, you know, the, the gates are thrown open. I mean, there's not a single people that I could think of in the tribal areas of a place like pre-Christian Europe that didn't have witch doctors and sorcerers and, um, you know, druids and all kinds of people who were in touch with the metaphysical, um, but once Christianity gets involved, all that stuff is is subservient to the dominant religion, and then the magic stuff all happens from the deity. It doesn't happen from some. I mean, you say alchemists. Alchemists are almost more like scientists than they are magic users in that period. If you want to look at them that way, I mean, the connotation's mm -hmm. not magic; it's uh, wisdom and knowledge and stuff in books. Um, but you go to, say, the Dark Ages, and there's all kinds of weird stuff going on with magic and, and spells and incantations and what we would call voodoo and all sorts of things. You know, it's interesting you bring up the Dark Ages because it's one of those things that you know, we name it the Dark Ages. And so we assume that there was no learning and no uh, culture happening and the world was plunged into darkness. But – you know, as you've pointed out on the show yourself, that's not necessarily the case, is it? No, it also depends on where you were. I mean, the Dark Ages, what we call the Dark Ages in Europe, is the zenith of Arab civilization that they still look back to today uh, uh, fondly because uh, the Arabs were one of the most, if not the most, technologically sophisticated. I mean, they were on top of the world at that time. Uh, the Chinese have always, I mean, they have their Dark Ages between uh, imperial periods, but they were always strong. So I think what it means when you say Dark Ages is literally that's all the the ironing out of the fall of the Roman Empire. Hey, how long would it take for our descendants if our culture collapsed? And as you guys know, you've listened to the show, that's a recurring theme, this whole idea mm -hmm. that we're right. so arrogant right. to think that our that ours is the final civilization, that there'll never be a collapse again. But assuming that there was, how long would it take for our descendants to look at the thing that we created and wonder how the heck that was ever done or if some race of giants had done it? And that's what happened in in the post-Roman world where here were – here was, I mean, amazing stuff from aqueducts to – buildings to all sorts of things that the people only a hundred years later, you know, that's two or three generations, they had no idea how you did this. And in places like Roman Britain, they were trying as hard as they could to remember how to even fix this stuff. And <laughs> so, even, I mean, I think, yeah, so, that, or, so to them, it was a dark age. Yeah. Or even at the, at the least, they didn't have the, the infrastructure anymore that the Roman Republic or the Roman empire provided to even, make those things anymore to even provide that there was well, think, a I think about how valuable it becomes to say i've got these wonderful baths we could never make them again <laughs> let's let's hope we can keep them running as long as we can exactly and and it's it's very interesting when you talk about the dark ages and the fall of the roman empire and how that was again that was a transition period it, things just kind of the slowly crumbled and dwindled away from that, from the ancient world into the, that, I guess, I don't know, new timeline, if you, a new era. There was a really, uh, the, the thing that struck me most, I mean, we talk about these grand uh, engineering feats, et cetera, but there's been a picture running around being passed around on the internet a lot lately of a discovery that was made some time ago, archeological oh, yeah. discovery of, from around the third century AD of a Roman multi-tool. Dan, have you seen this? I don't know. A Roman multi-tool. Can you be more it's specific? Just, it, it looks like a little a Swiss Roman Army verb? knife. It oh, looks like a like Roman a version of the it, Gerber, huh? It, it looks like a little Swiss Army knife. It's got a spoon. It's got various things on really nicely done hinges. You would buy this in a shop today and feel you'd bought a very high-quality product. And it's from 300 AD. That stuff doesn't surprise me, though. I mean, the tech, I think some of the things that those people did is so much more clever than we assume sometimes, like we talked about at the very beginning of the program, um, that, that 
when you actually see it, well, I mean, there's still a big controversy over things like batteries. Did these oh, people the, have batteries? Was um, it and a, what did they the, use them for? Was it Lebanon? Is that where they found it? Yeah, I think they found them elsewhere too. And I think the prevailing wisdom has always been that they've used them for things like electroplating and stuff. Yeah, they but, found um, one in Iraq, I believe, many years ago. But what that does is every time you, you know, to get back to the H.G. Wells idea, is that every time you find something like that, the whole dominoes start tumbling again, and the, the past now becomes recreated. I mean, you have to reorient the whole picture that we humans from now have constructed about the past and change it around because it no longer is accurate anymore. I mean, that's when you can actually see how fungible the past is. <laughs> Once you find one new discovery, you have to go, oh, my gosh, well, if that's true, then this is true, and then this is true, and then this is true, and all these things that you haven't discovered yet, and that's really true. There's all this stuff that still hasn't been found, and as soon as we find it, it's going to once again reorient our whole idea of the past. It's like Back to the Future when you know the picture starts fading, <laughs> when history changes. I mean, it, really, we, we're recreating our vision of the past with every new discovery like a battery that we didn't expect. Mm. I think it's great that you brought up H.G. Wells again. Um, this actually is, leads to a good segue for us to wrap up a little bit here because, of course, we've talked about H.G. Wells being a great fan of history, and he's also seen as the father of modern – well, at least the father of modern wargaming and, I guess, by extension of Dungeons & Dragons as well with his oh, he wrote little, little wars. He wrote Little Wars and all those yeah. kinds of things, yeah. So – Dan, I'd like to ask you just uh, in the last couple of minutes we have left to maybe talk about some of your favorite sources, whether it's in books, movies, or anywhere else that you think you'd like to point some people at if they want to really get excited about these same sorts of things. Well, one of my criticisms of modern history, and it, it's both a criticism and an applaud. I'm, I'm applauding them at the same time, but history has become a science. It didn't used to be a science. It really used to be – I mean if you go to um, to some of the old curriculums at old universities, history is one of the social sciences. It's classified with religion and literature and those things, and it's become much more like a hard science now, which is both good and bad. It's bad because when you pick up a modern history book, it looks like you're reading geology or <laughs> – you know, I mean it, mm. it's, it's – which is all well and good because it gives us better history. That's the upside. The downside is you lose the artistic side of it. Part of what makes history history are the writers of history. And so when you say sources you like, especially if you're trying to construct worlds or be some sort of a gamer, you want to get a feel for, for the eras in a way that the great historians could give you. And so, like, for example, I have on my shelf, um, it's called The History of Civilization by Will and Ariel Durant, and it's one of the great sets of books that belongs in every good library. And one of the great things about Will Durant is when you read his books, it is literature in a sense. Um, it is an oral story. It's, it's the best. In my opinion, it was an era in the, for example, between the 1930s and the early 1960s, when you had the best mix of the two kinds of history, it was accurate, like modern history, but it hadn't lost that literary feel that brought those stories to life and gave them color and feeling, whereas the stuff today can be so dry, you don't get that color. And so I find that, um, and that's what's kind of fun about H.G. Wells, too, is that you know he's giving you um, color. And that's what's missing from some of the more modern stuff. You wouldn't want to be without the modern stuff, but if you're talking about history from a, a, a gamer's standpoint, it's fun to go to some of those used bookstores and find some of that stuff written in the 1950s, early 1960s, and you get a real feel for you know they, they don't shy away from the wild, colorful stuff. Excellent. Well, Dan, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to to come on our show with us this week. Um, I appreciate you guys having me. And 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 I want to for, for those of our listeners who are not you know already Dan Carlin fans, please go to dancarlin.com and check out Hardcore History. And actually, I recommend Common Sense as well. It's another favorite. Um, and 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 thank you again. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you guys. I hope it works out well for you. I appreciate your time.
creature, 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 creature. Okay, and uh, welcome now back to the Creature Feature Theater. Uh, last week we had Matt, our producer. Matt, how you doing? Doing good, good. Great interview we just got done with. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. Everyone should enjoy Too that. Much fun. I, Nick had the most fun, I could tell. I don't know. I think well, Jason had fun, but I well, think Nick so, had more get, fun. You get two or more people who are, you know, either like know history or studied history. It's like it's hard not to... It's hard not to talk about it, especially if he, he's obviously passionate about it. Oh, yeah. And that's what I love about his show. Um, so, yeah, hopefully you know, hats we'll off have, to Dan. Uh, yeah, hopefully lots of lots of the history fans listening to the show, if you don't already know about it, will be going and uh, listening to more Dan Carlin because it's it's just a great – It's it, I wasn't kidding. It's really my favorite podcast. Oh, he's Next to great, ours. <laughs> great, great speaker. He he had me in, enthralled listening to all the history and everything. I know nothing about history, so I just let you two take the reins, and you guys totally like were wonderful doing that. So I, now you know a little more. Now I know more. And now, and knowing's half the battle. GI Joe. Uh, Yo, so, Joe. Want we get it right? All right. <laughs> so what I don't know is much about our creature. No. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. Let's give the platform to uh, Matt and the microphone. Matt. Okay. Well, our creature from last week, if we go to our wonderful love theme folio, page 18, they're mm-hmm. the Caryatid Column, they're oh. act- which actually has a basis in history as well, because those are actually uh, any of the old columns you would see in, like, Greek architecture are the same type of column. And, oh. Yeah. So these creatures are just, like, Slim decorative pillar stones about seven feet high, mm-hmm. and they basically are used for defensive. A uh, very high level magic user, you have to be at least level 16 to actually create these. How do, how do they get created? They get created um, similar to that of a stone golem, except they're very, it takes more. Uh, mm-hmm. More power, more gold to create, more resources, mm-hmm. hence right. the higher level required. And so when we first went up against them, I was thinking maybe they couldn't come off their platforms or something. Yeah. That was just totally not true, was it? No, no. It, <laughs> pretty much they are just given like very simple instructions, Okay. and they'll do that instruction to the best of their ability. And their instruction last week's case was make sure no one steps comes into the tomb. So that's why they were just following you around the tomb on the outside, but not stepping off because you weren't encroaching on it. As soon as you started attacking and threatening them, at that point, that's when they started to defend themselves. So they did a you, pretty good job. <laughs> yeah. Are uh, they intelligent in any way? No, they are non intelligent. Um, they have. So no alignment. No alignment at all. Um, they're pretty much just automatons. Uh, they have their instruction, and that is it. Huh. How about uh, magic resistance? Magic resistance, they have plus four to their saving throws, <laughs> but they also have something else, uh, as what happened with the our wonderful dwarf's uh, battle axe. Yeah. They have a twenty-five yeah. percent <laughs> chance to break any weapon. Oh, oh. that's their special little thing. Yes. Yeah, I and read that a, too. I'm like, wow. <laughs> and if it's a magical weapon. And non-magical weapons do half damage. Magic that's weapons. why it took so long with my battle. <laughs> that's, yes. why, that's where you were going with all the, yeah, you're chipping them a little bit. Right, because they actually have a fixed hit point. It's 22 hit points. It's oh, what do they, what do they so, fight as as far as hit dice, though? Uh, they're a five-hit die. So they fight as a five-hit die creature. Okay. Yeah, they fight as a five-hit die creature. Magical weapons do normal damage, but they lose the plus. Oh, so wow. And Matt, it wait, they break... lose they lose the plus to hit and to damage. Uh, to damage. So if you have a plus two sword, yes, you hit them with a plus two, but okay. you lose the plus two for damage. And for what every... about if you have a cursed sword? Ooh, <laughs> oh, Jason, <laughs> I don't know. Well, it actually I... the way it's worded. You take damage when you, you hit the sword. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it, you can actually break magic. Can, they can actually break magical weapons as well. Oh, man, that's nasty. So if, if your sword's a plus one sword, you get to subtract 
5%. If it's plus 2, you subtract 10% from the base 25% chance. So if you have a plus 5 sword, it won't break. But that plus 4 sword, 5% chance of it breaking anytime you hit it. Wow. Mm, So how many hit points did it have total? 22. Oh, Every time. Yeah. Wow. So that... And that's why when they were hit with the twenty-four or the twenty-three point fireball, the one at full strength just shattered. Yeah, nice. Okay. <laughs> so magic is their weakness. So if you have a lot of firepower, no pun intended. Yeah. Uh, you can actually take them out rather easily. But if you actually just go in there trying to hack and slash your way through them, you're kind of tough. Mm. So is there anywhere you would not be able to find them? Can they can they breathe underwater? Can they can they live in any envir- live so to speak in any environment? <laughs> yeah. Uh they can be in any type of environment that the uh they they have no requirements as for breathing or anything of that nature. They're strictly hmm. magical creatures that yeah. they similar to that of a golem. I could totally see these underwater or something. Oh yeah. Oh, those these would be nasty underwater yeah. just that added extra element being underwater fighting these things what a tough yeah. combat that would be especially since a lot of spells don't work the same way underwater if yeah. you can't you know either you can't use the uh, the uh, material components or maybe you can't do the exact somatic components i've read some i don't know if it's in the dungeon master's guide or if somebody wrote an article in dragon about it but somebody has looked into what happens to spells underwater so it'd be tougher going up against them, I'm sure. Right. I mean, the, this is pretty much for the high-level magic user that basically wants to protect his stuff or to prevent someone from entering his lair. They're just basically for those that a golem's just not enough. It's actually kind of interesting that you need to have a 16th-level magic user to make this creature, yet the, the column itself is fairly weak. If you really think about it, you'd need to have quite a few of them to do to do any good. If you're talking about a, a higher level set of adventurers coming at it, right? Uh, the in the book it actually lists the number appearing anywhere from one to twelve. Whoa! Yeah, I would think that you probably would. If you, if I'm a sixteenth level magic user, thinking about the types of creatures and adventurers that are going to come up against me. I think that I would need some tough ones. I think I'd need a few of these. Yeah. 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 I, I'm, I really think they're, they're more to just scare people off. Uh, for those that aren't, aren't magically inclined, if you have a bunch of like, low-level fighters and thieves, they go in, like, oh, these statues are attacking us. They hack at them all of a sudden. Their weapons break. At that point, mm-hmm. they're probably going to leave. So they're as much as deterrent as they are an actual threat. Sort of a scarecrow for adventurers. Exactly. Yeah. Almost like a almost like a magical version of a guard dog, and you don't have to feed it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Although they probably wouldn't be your last line of defense. Right. That's they that's why they're more for like your entryway. Yeah. It's just, Although if I'm making a dungeon and I've just thought about, you know, what did the magic user set up for things, they could make a really good um uh, uh what's the word i'm looking for distraction uh lure right. so basically i'd put them somewhere to make people think that's where the good stuff was oh right. oh and yeah that, good idea yeah and that's actually a uh, decoy they, uh, yes a decoy that's the word yeah. i was looking for right. yeah because their instructions could even be just make sure they don't go into this room how and they can interpret that however they choose so right. instead of instead of okay killing everyone to make sure they don't go in, how about we just lead them down this other tunnel, mm-hmm. down into this pit trap or whatever, even or more teleport deep. trap. Make that sure you was... throw them in the teleport trap. Yes, the teleport <laughs> trap. I, Everybody I loves could, the teleport trap. Yeah, I could see even from the player side when you would run into like you know I don't know how many six, eight, ten, twelve of these things. On the player end, you're probably thinking, man, there must be something really good beyond those doors or beyond that threshold. So that's a good way of, like, you know, using this as kind of a trap, a diversion. From, I wonder from if you could ever risk. get them to go with you. Hmm. I mean, if, if you made them. If you're, the, if you're the 16th level magic user, if you could make some to travel with you. Hmm. Uh, that's a good question, yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, could be like, decent guards to have around. I don't care how high level the magic user is. He never wants to be hit with a sword. Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, it says they actually, if the creator is nearby, he can control them. So if that 16th level magic user is off in the other room as to where they are, he can actually control them. So he can say, I, I like the idea of a wizard who has decided to make a sedan chair carried by four of these <laughs> columns. <laughs> Somehow that sounds really cool. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. That's how he gets around. And when the, and when the bad times come, they set him down and just they just protect him. Yes, I could definitely see that. Okay. I'm liking this creature more and more. Yeah, I mean, look at the picture of him. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what where page was this on again, Matt? Page 18 of the theme folio. All right, everyone, take a look at that and give us your ideas how you'd use this uh, creature and write into us, staff at gmail.com, or even leave us a voicemail, 570-865-4210, and uh, just talk about it. We want to hear you. We like your voice. We like you. So let's head into our last installment of The Lumpers, Episode 5, that's going to wrap everything up, and then we'll be right back. It's tough out there. Orcs, goblins, bad and mad mages. Things that an each of give you the time of day. People that shake your head while looking for a place to put a dagger. Yeah, it's tough. So they're tougher. They're the lumpers. Ready? Sure, sweetie. Go ahead. The Case of Spare Parts, Part 5. Let me see. Looking for two missing dwarves. Found a locket we think is the kids. Got a giant attack at the warehouse. Dead giant was one of the dwarves. Went out to Gums. Found the other dwarf polymorphed. Riders coming. Okay. I quietly slipped through the back door, crouched down in the shadows on the other side of the woodpile, and watched. I had a decent view of the front door through the back screen. The bedroom window was right above me. Gum was stuttering a greeting as the three pushed their way into the place. Curious bunch. The first guy in was tall and thin and had a black leather overcoat on with a black slouch hat on his head, which he took off when he got in. His bald dome was shaped like one end of a lemon, and his face looked like it had been sucking the other end. Next came a hooded figure in a red cloak. A red wizard if I ever saw one. The biggest was the knoll. He was carrying something in a large sack. I could see whatever it was in the sack was breathing. Take our guests to the back room, Baldy said. The knoll nodded and went into the bedroom. I could hear him plunking the sack down on the bed. The knoll was just removing the sack as I strained to peek through the window. The figure was a familiar one. Moria, complete with a small glowing stasis necklace around her neck. The other two came in the room just as the knoll finished tying the hands and feet. I noticed the beast had a lump on the side of his head. Hope that was Moria's doing. Baldy removed the necklace. He then whispered something to the knoll who left the room. Now, my dear, he said with a quiet, serpentine voice, I understand you've been looking for family. Well, I just happen to know where one member is. Yes, I can help you with that. You fiend! Where's my brother? The red wizard frowned. Carry it! Do we really have time for this? Our order was due yesterday. Patience, patience, Carry it hissed. This lovely lady has been making inquiries about our activities. We need to know who she has been in contact with about it. Besides, such a curious and persistent creature deserves answers. Moria spat on the floor in his direction. Your knoll got all the answers that you'll get out of me. You tell me, or I'll give you one on that bald head of yours. In case you haven't noticed, you're hardly in a position to carry that threat out. No matter, you'll soon be in no position to share what you've learned. At that moment, I saw a familiar glow in my front pouch. I mentally cursed and quietly scampered over behind the smokehouse. I pulled the talk stone out of my pouch. Lojack! Came a familiar elven voice. Lojack here and keep it down, I whispered. Moria's gone. I was escorting her back when we were attacked by a mage and a gnome. They seized Moria and cast a sleep spell on me. I've just now recovered. Yeah, okay, I found her. Get Dick and Mac and get out to... And the lights went out, courtesy of a sharp blow of a sword hilt to the noggin. I had a curious dream. I dreamt I was tied up at the beach and a knoll was splashing water from the ocean in my face. I woke up and saw one standing in front of me with a bucket. Carrion and the Red Wizard was there, too. Moria was also facing me, tied to a chair similar to the one I was tied up in. 
Carrion told the knoll to stand guard outside. Ah, another curious one, Carrion declared. One, low jack, the lumper. That's what it says on my underwear. I'm addressing Joseph Carrion. Correct. I understand you've been asking questions on this lady's behalf. Yeah, keeps me out of trouble. You been doing all this? Oh, yes. And quite profitably, I assure you. Would you like to know why? I can guess, I said. Supply and demand? Naturally, Carrion continued. So, what's the deal here, if you don't mind my asking? Not at all. It won't matter, because soon both of you won't be able to speak of this, or at all. He grabbed a chair and sat uncomfortably close to my ear. You see, mages need material components, some quite rare, yes. Since I had a knowledge of the transmutation arts, and being a road mage isn't as profitable as I'd like, I decided to fill that need. It's deceptively simple. Advertise for caravan cards, polymorph them, see to their demise, and take what the client needs. And, of course, friends and family would never want to find out what happened to, say, Uncle Dud. That, he glared at the Red Wizard, was an oversight on the part of those who tried to cut out the middleman, as it were. Now we have this little matter to tidy up. Oh, well, just more parts to collect. He looked at Moria, who was weeping. A shame, really. So pretty for a dwarf. But I have orders to fill. She'll make a fine hippogriff. Suddenly I heard a loud clunk outside and a yelp. Carrion turned and looked outside. I heard another sound, one of a bow being pulled. I kicked my chair backwards, taking me with it. I heard a shush as an arrow hit Carrion square in the chest. He staggered back, and the next thing I know, there was a magical explosion, and the room was filled with webbing. The door was pushed open, and Dinkus, bow in hand, was standing there. You like it? He said to me, beaming. I finally finished it. Web arrows. By an elf with the spell. Well, tell him to get in here and dispel it. Aye, he said, and ran off to get the elf. After he got rid of the spell, two deputies and Bub rushed in. Bub, the constable's mage, put the low lice in a hold spell, and then two of the burlier deputies carried them outside to a waiting cart. Byron and I walked outside to where Dink was. He was looking at a heap of knoll on the ground. A giant chain was on top. Poor creature, Byron said. He waylaid me and then wanted to check me for weapons, including my hat. I suppose I shouldn't have uttered the trigger word then. He had a wry smile on his face. How did you know where I was? Talkstone lad, Dink said as we were walking back. He never turned it off. Yes, marvelous homing device, Byron interjected. At that point, Moria came up to us. She hugged each of us. I can't thank you enough for this. She gave each of us a coin. It was larger than most, with a hammer on one side. Those are linked to my clan. If you're ever in dire need, tap twice. Any clan member will rush to your aid if they're able. Dinkus gave her a hug. Take care, lass. I'll see your mother and brother soon. Then she walked to the cart. Boy, I like to watch her walk. Byron nudged me back to reality as Matt came over and shook our hands. We heard everything through the stone. That'll keep the high car busy for a while, he said, shaking my hand. Thanks. You've been a big help. Send us a total on this, and I'm sure the department will be glad to pay you. I intend to, I said as I handed the deputy badge back. Mac put up his hand. Hang on to those. I'll keep you guys in reserve. I'm short of help enough around here. He walked back to the car, got in, and took off. I turned to Byron and Dink. Supper? I said. Byron gave me a look. Aren't we forgetting something? I slapped my head. Oh, yeah. Let's go get poor Angus and have you dispel him. He's probably starved, too. Byron shook his head. Humans, he muttered. By the way, I said as we walked to the back, can you help out Charlie when we get back? He got polymorphed again. Byron sighed. Yes, I suppose. What is he this time? Let's just say I've lost my taste for roast duck. Well, that's about it. Okay, sweetie. I'll have these scribed in the morning. The usual copies? Yeah. Hey, how about a drink? They got bars downstairs tonight. <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. Music for this episode was by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Voices heard in this episode were Glenn Hallstrom and Julie Hoverson. Tune in next time for another episode of The Lumpers.
one of those electronic voting dealies. Okay, so uh, the Lumpers is done. What did you guys think? Love that show. I wish we had more. <laughs> yeah, it's going to wrap things up because uh, I think, Jason, we've uncovered some more uh, Thane scrolls, apparently. Yes, yes, we have. The the Lumpers, oh. is that is that Glenn that's uh, working with the Lumpers? Yeah, that's Glenn. Yeah, so I just wanted to let everybody know that if you go to, the, to our website, um, rfipodcast.com, there's a story on there called uh, Ask Us a Question. And you'll see a couple of videos. You'll see me. I'm sitting there, you know, reading my book and waiting for people to ask me anything they want to ask. And Glenn is on there, too. Yes. He... So if you want to ask Glenn a question, you can see what he looks like and hear what he says. It's a cool little feature called uh, VU, V-Y-O-U dot com. And basically, you can just ask anybody who's got an account. You ask, type in a question, and then that person, you know, responds with a little video within a few hours or a day. So ask Glenn some questions. Ask him about the lumpers. Yeah, definitely. And uh, all right, you asked for it. You got it, folks. The poll of the week is now the ten foot ten pole. Ten foot pole. As much as Yay! yeah, yeah. As much Yay! as be quiet. <laughs> as much as Jason and I both voted no. I know I least voted no. Stupid democracy. Yeah. Yay. We you you asked for it. We gave it to you. But this week we have a very very important poll up here. We Jason and I were talking. As well with Nick, we want to know where you heard the we heard about the Roll for Initiative podcast. Where did you first hear about this podcast? Did someone, a friend, email you about it and tell you about it? Was this a word of mouth thing? Did you go on Google and see one of uh, one of the many ads we have, or were you sitting around on Facebook chatting with your friends playing Farmville and you saw a Facebook <laughs> ad? <laughs> or did you check in any of the many truck stops I've been to around the country, writing it down on bathroom walls? Ew, Jason. <laughs> uh, I don't want to know for about a good that. time. Listen to Roll for Initiative. Oh, geez, I can't. I feel bad for those people. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> or you came from D20 Radio. Just go to the go there, Dragon's Foot, or maybe you were at Gen Con and you saw one of the many flyers that we didn't distribute illegally at the Gen Con. <laughs> they were very legally. They were legally passed out. We really did only uh, hand them when somebody asked. Um, but I yeah. also, you know, since you're bringing up, I do want to take a second and thank all the guys from Dead Game Society, New York Red Box, oh, yeah. um, uh, the you know, Gamers Rule. A lot of people have been really nice and taking some of those flyers for us and taking them to things that they've gone to. So I just want to say thanks again. We really appreciate it. That's awesome. Thank you. And there's two more options. Heard it from another podcast or some other way. Please go to there and vote. We're just curious. We're taking a, just a general poll where you guys have uh, come from. Yeah, we'd like to know. We'd like to know. And I believe there is also uh, one more highlight on the website. There's a new article up uh, called I'm Your Zero. Yes. Uh, is that a Todd Hughes uh, article? I can't. I, my computer's a roll lo- uh, loading up very yeah, slow. Yeah, I, th- I think Todd, Todd put this one up. And um, let me just run over to that article really quick. It's the latest plus two to save. Yes, I got it right And now. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. It's talking about zero level uh, PCs. So. Cool. Go there and comment on it. The forums are booming. We uh, thank our mo- our moderator, Lass, who's been moderating, and all the people that have been uh, chatting away. I think Chuck Lass was in the lead for the most posts, but he's been switching back and forth, I think, with Drama Man. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, by the way, I <laughs> oh, yeah, think I'm winning? up about five posts now Ooh, on our message all right. Yeah, yeah, Drama I'm... Man. Drama Man is definitely uh, way up high there. He's... Uh, what level is he at? I'll have to look it up. Um, but yeah, Drama Man's winning. So if you want to beat Drama Man, you've really got to get talking. Definitely. Go there, chat in our forums, go uh, listen to uh, uh, The Quest for the Book of Sorrows, my Actual Play podcast. You can go to rfiactualplay.tk and you can uh, download the podcast or go through iTunes, mine, or Jason's. Uh, what was it? Jason Barron's of Hogsen was yours was called? Yeah, Barons of Hogsend. How's, and, uh, how's that oh, going? I just looked. Drama Man is all the way up to Enchanter. He may be the. Ooh. He might be our only Enchanter on the boards at this point. Whoa. Yeah, but yeah, Barons of Hogsend. That's right. How was your? Uh... I'm a little behind because yeah. I haven't been. Uh, ev- I feel so bad. Every week for the past three weeks, something has happened at the last minute. I've had to leave town for work, or something else has occurred, and so these guys are just sitting here waiting. But we're going to be playing this week, so awesome. Get up to them. Oh, you're Jones in for a game then. Yes. Well, I'm going to say this is Vince signing off for Jason and Nick, saying keep it original, keep it old school, and 
Good night, everybody. Roll for initiative.